the Compass and Cherokee, two not so different vehicles in the Jeep lineup. They even look pretty similar these days, making it even harder to choose between them. But looks can be deceiving, and both are good at different things in some ways that might even surprise you. We're gonna kick things off in the Cherokee, so let's get some obvious differences aside. Yes, the Cherokee is the bigger of the two vehicles, and it's also the more expensive. Now, a base version with front wheel drive will set you back about 33 grand with freight and fees, and that compares to about 27,000 bucks for a base compass with front wheel drive, the same 2.4 liter engine that you get in the base Cherokee, but a six speed manual transmission instead of an automatic. Now, there are about nine different versions of the Cherokee you can get, as well as three engines, two drive configurations, and a whole ton of options. Basically, the choice is yours of how you want to set your Cherokee up. Now, the one I'm driving is the high altitude trim, so not quite the top of the heap, but pretty close. It'll set you back about 51,000 bucks with freight and fees. No small sum of money and definitely a big pill to swallow compared to some competitors in this segment that are priced more closely to the mid $40,000 range. Now, what you're getting for that money is a ride that's almost premium in its execution. It's not quite on the same level as the Grand Cherokee, but it is pretty close. I would consider this thing a baby Grand in that way. It has a real weightedness to it. It feels premium. It drives almost like a Mercedes Benz in the way it cruises down the road. There's definitely a heft to it that gives it a nice ride and handling. Now the same goes for the cabin. It's nice and quiet in here and it's pretty well refined, especially in this high altitude version. This leather, well, it's probably about as nice as anything this side of Mercedes-Benz or BMW, a big plus for the Cherokee. It just has that nice feel to it when you slip inside of this thing that you're not gonna tear into it because it's pretty good quality, but it also has a nice and supple feel. It's easy to clean, I dig it a lot features are the same. We've got heated front seats, heated steering wheel, and ventilated seats in this version I'm driving. Now that premium feel all comes crashing to a halt when you take a look at the buttons here on the center stack. Big chunky knobs and cheap looking buttons just cheapen the whole vibe in here. And there's also no buttons for your heated seats or your heated steering wheel. And that means you have to access those features through the infotainment screen. Not the end of the world when you're at a stop, but once you're out on the road, well, it is a distraction. It is cool that Chrysler has it set up so that you can access those features on startup. Hit the ignition, both the heated seats and the heated steering wheel are on the home screen, but then they go away, which means when you're done with the bun warmer, well, you have to go in through the infotainment system and navigate to it that way, which I do not like at all. Fiat Chrysler does hit back with this newer version of Uconnect that has shortcut buttons running along the bottom of the infotainment screen. Now those are configurable, so if you wanna switch them around and say have Apple CarPlay on there as well as your heated seats and steering wheel function, climate and nav, well you can have all of those set up so you can quickly access those features when you want them instead of finding the icon on the touch screen. Very cool stuff. And that is a great segue to this infotainment system itself because it is pretty damn good. Now this high altitude trim I'm driving has an 8.4 inch touchscreen and it also has built in Wi-Fi, which is great for kids on road trips. Set Netflix up and they will be quiet the entire time. I really like that, you know, it's a really family friendly feature. It's something that Fiat Chrysler offers in a lot of its vehicles and it's something to take note of if you're in the market for a new vehicle for your family. You know, the other thing about this cabin is that aside from the quality of the materials, it's just really quiet and really comfortable in here. There's plenty of room to stretch out in the front seat, except for headroom with this optional panoramic sunroof. And now speaking of options, there's about $6,000 worth of them in this Cherokee. And that's what helps drive the price up to 51 grand with freight and fees. That is a lot of money. Like I said, it's more than most competitors in this class. So take note if you've got a Jeep on your shopping list that you're going to have to pony up in order to afford a good one. Now, those features get you all kinds of stuff. Like I said, this big panoramic sunroof is pretty cool. There's also a whole suite of safety features like adaptive cruise control and lane keep assist. And there's also a self parking system. Now that's something you can't get in the Compass. So it's a cool added bonus in this slightly larger Cherokee. 
Now, speaking of that, it is larger, so it drives bigger. It's not hard to drive, it's not difficult to park, but you will notice going from one to the next that there is just a little bit more vehicle you have to worry about, and that's something to take note of in parking lots especially. Moving on to what's under the hood, like I said, the base motor in the Cherokee is the same 2.4 liter you get in the Compass. Now there are two optional engines in here, the first one being a V6, and then there's this two liter turbo. Now that's the one I'm driving. So let's start with the V6, because previous to this, that's the only version of the Cherokee I drove, and I liked it a lot. And if you plan to tow, well, that's the engine you should get, because you can pull about 4,500 pounds with the Cherokee, which is about best in the class. Now this two liter is rated to tow about 4,000 pounds, so it's no slouch either, but I'm not sure I would want to tow with this motor. It would really take its toll after a while and would have to work really hard to pull all that weight around. Now output from this two liter engine gets down really nicely and really smoothly. And the only way you're gonna miss a naturally aspirated engine is when it comes to the sound because it definitely doesn't sound that nice when you step on it. It has that really buzzy vibe of a four cylinder with a turbo bolted to it, but it's really linear and smooth throttle response. And the nine speed automatic transmission it's mated to is pretty well executed as well. It does short shift at times, so it's shifting usually below 3000 RPM under normal acceleration, which does take some getting used to, but it's not that bad once you do, and it helps save fuel. Now, speaking of saving fuel, the version I'm driving does have four wheel drive, but it's the type of system that operates in front wheel drive most of the time, and only in four wheel drive when it detects wheel slip, or if you use this knob on the center console to engage the four wheel drive system yourself. You can adjust it to a snow setting, mud, sand, rocks, all kinds of off-road terrain that you might need your four-wheel drive all the time. Well, you can go ahead, set it with this knob, and off you go. Now, the Compass has a very similarly executed four-wheel drive system, so I'm not going to go over it again. But I will say this, though. Fiat Chrysler Canada has decided not to put winter tires on either of these things, and it's not doing either of them any favors, especially on a day like today. Lots of snow and lots of low traction situations, which is fine when you're trying to put the power down, but when you're trying to stop, well, it's a completely different story. Traction and grip are totally different, and just because you can get more power down doesn't mean you can stop any quicker. And I do think it's a shame that they've decided not to put winter rubber on these things. Okay, so we've covered the Cherokee pretty thoroughly, and it's got some clear advantages over the Compass, especially when it comes to engine options, as well as overall cabin refinement. But before we hop in the Compass to go for a ride, I just wanna take a look at them side by side. Now the Cherokee is the larger vehicle and it measures about 10 inches longer from bumper to bumper. But if you think that means more space inside, well, you'll be surprised to know that that's not actually the case. Looking behind the tailgates, you've got 770 liters of space in the Compass compared to 730 in the Cherokee. No, that's not a huge difference and it's one that becomes even less so when you lower the cargo floor in the Cherokee. But when you fold the back seats down, there's actually more space in the Compass. There's 1,700 liters of overall cargo room compared to just 1,550 in the Cherokee. Again, not a significant difference, but one to be mindful of if you plan to carry cargo with any frequency. And now let's talk about those back seats for a minute because I'm actually more comfortable in the Compass than I am in the Cherokee with the driver's seat in my position. Now I am on the taller side and I think that's pretty significant, especially if you plan to carry adults around with any frequency. Well, it's important to know that you've got more space in the smaller of these two vehicles. You know, ever since the Cherokee got less ugly a couple years ago, there's some serious styling similarities between these two things from their exteriors. But when you get inside, it's completely different. And I personally prefer the look of the Compass. There's this really cool hexagonal theme going on with the pattern on the seats and some of the same shapes on the dash and the panels, pretty cool stuff. There's a bit too much gloss black plastic in here, but I can live with it for the trade-off you get in terms of the aesthetics. Now there is the same cluster of buttons under the center stack that you get in the Cherokee, and I'm not so crazy about that because there's no heated steering wheel or heated seat switches. There's also no ventilated seats in the one I'm driving, but you can get them in the Compass. Now, speaking of the space in between the driver and passenger, 
We talked about how the Cherokee is bigger from an overall length perspective, but it's also wider. And that means there's less space between the driver and front seat passenger. So the console is much smaller. There's not as much room for your stuff. Like there's nowhere to put your phone when you have it plugged in, except for this little side pocket next to the passenger footwell not really ideal when you're by yourself in the car, especially when you have your cup holders being used by drinks. There's nowhere to put your phone at all. But you know, even though it's more narrow in here, I'm definitely not cramped compared to the Cherokee, and there's a similar amount of room. Now there is no sunroof in this thing, but I do feel really roomy, really comfortable, and I get great visibility. I can turn my head without fear of whacking it off of this handle here, and it's better than a lot of competitors in this segment. I'm driving the altitude trim, so middle of the pack in terms of what you can get in this Compass. And it's priced around 41 grand with freight and fees, which is no small sum. You know, I do think it's a little pricey, especially when you compare it to some competitors. The Ford Escape, which recently won our small SUV comparison, well, that thing caps out at about 45 grand for a fully loaded version. To think that this thing is only the middle of the road and it's going to cost you 41 grand is a bit of a tough pill to swallow. So what are you getting for that money? Well, features are good, but not great. You get the same 8.4 inch touchscreen infotainment system that you get in the Cherokee we're driving, as well as a Wi-Fi hotspot. Like I said, no ventilated front seats, but there are heated front seats and a heated steering wheel. No heated rear seats. That to me is just a no brainer this day and age, but hey, maybe that's just me. Some other features this thing has, parking sensors, but no self parking. So it's not a fully featured vehicle, but it's decently equipped. It does have a great safety suite you can get. So it has things like adaptive cruise control, lane departure warning, lane keep assist, and some automatic emergency braking. It's a pretty well-rounded package, but again, you are going to have to pay for that. Now drive configuration is just like the Cherokee. Base models come with front wheel drive, but you can get upgraded to all wheel drive and some of the upper trims come with all wheel drive as standard. Under the hood, well, there's only one engine choice and that's the 2.4 liter that's the base engine in the Cherokee. And I thought it was gonna be pretty dull, but I have to be honest, it's pretty peppy. It surprised me just how quick this thing is and how responsive it is. It's got the same nine speed automatic that we have in the Cherokee here, but it just really runs through the gears a lot nicer. And it seems like the throttle response is mapped very, very well for a vehicle this size and this weight. It makes it feel like it's not missing that turbo engine, though I do really wish Jeep would offer it because I think that would really put the emphasis on sport in sport utility here. As far as the drive goes, well, I covered it in the Cherokee, but let's just reiterate. That thing is definitely the one you wanna go with if you want something that feels a little bit more refined and a little bit more premium. It really is like a baby Grand Cherokee in the way that it rides and handles. This thing is similar, but not quite there. It has some of the weightedness, but it's not quite the same. So it's pretty flat and it feels like the suspension isn't absorbing the bumps the way it is in the Cherokee. More harsher pavement is absorbed through the body as opposed to the suspension. And it's really more audible than anything else, but it is a discomfort. Fuel economy results this week have been about the same as what we're getting in that two liter turbocharged Cherokee, about 10 and a half liters per hundred kilometers. And it has been a pretty cold week, pretty snowy. I'm not disappointed in the fuel economy this thing has returned, especially considering it is all wheel drive. It is a naturally aspirated engine and it is a Jeep. Now, in terms of the testers themselves, the build quality definitely isn't up to the same standard here as it is in the Cherokee. There's some more creaks and rattles in this thing. Around this door, I can hear a lot more noise when I go over bumps. The same thing goes for the HVAC system. There's this really odd metallic purr going on when the fan speed is on lower speed settings and it's really, really annoying. Even with the music on, you can still hear it and it's definitely something you should pay attention to if you test drive a Compass for yourself. The same goes for the brakes. Now I find the brakes in this thing are definitely touchier and stabbier than they are in the Cherokee. That could be just a symptom of how this thing was miled up and if the brakes weren't seated properly, but it is something to pay attention to because if you want brakes that are easy to modulate, well, you're not gonna find them in this particular tester. So keep an eye when you take one for a test drive yourself. 
To recap, I really like the refined drive of the Cherokee as well as the upscale interior and the turbocharged engine. I'm not so crazy about having to dive into the head unit to control the heated seats, the short shifting transmission, or how expensive it can be. When it comes to the Compass, I like the style and the space inside, and just like the Cherokee, it's got a great infotainment system. But it's also a bit expensive, the brakes are touchy, and there's only one engine offered. You know, I hate to say it, but you really can't go wrong with either of these Jeeps, and which one is right for you really depends on what you plan to do with it. If you plan to tow with any frequency, well, the choice is clear, and the Cherokee is the way to go, assuming you opt for that V6 engine. It's also the better choice in terms of refinement, delivering near premium levels of ride quality, as well as almost luxury levels of cabin comfort. If it were my money though, I'd probably save a few bucks and stick with the Compass. Yes, I wish Jeep offered it with that turbocharged engine, but the 2.4 liter under the hood isn't that bad. It's also got a really stylish cabin and there's even more space inside than the Cherokee, delivering everything I'd want in a small SUV.